Open in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all the well wishes, the cards, the encouragement. I uh, appreciate it more than I could ever express or be able to get you to understand. It means a great deal. I covet your prayers, especially over my eyesight. Um, because that's the real hindrance. But God is able. And that's all that really matters. Christmas is tough. Tough on you. Tougher on pastors. And I heard a minister this morning kind of express it the way that uh, it should be expressed. On Christmas, 95% of your congregation thinks they know as much about your subject as you do. And most that are sitting in church are wondering, what is that pastor going to tell me that I've not already heard? I, 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 I'm not going to tell you anything that you hadn't already heard. So if you're looking for a brand new boop, boop revelation, uh, I hope you're not too disappointed. But I am going to show you some things in a way that you might not have seen them before. Or thought about them. Mary's lamb. What a great song. Mary did you know. That your baby boy. That baby that was born in a manger. In a stable. But what better place. For a lamb to be born than in a stable. God didn't miss a thing. He was the lamb of God. He was Mary's little lamb. And he was born in a manger. This first chapter of Matthew kind of brings some thoughts together I know that the Christmas story is best in Luke, but from chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 20, it says, but after he considered this, it's talking about Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. In our childhood, more so when we were children than now, probably. Most of us learned a little song that uh, was named Mary Had a Little Lamb. It went something like this, and I want you to help me out. You that know it. Mary had... It's fleece, and everywhere that lamb. So we 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 learn that. What we didn't know, or some of us didn't know, that something like that actually happened. 
that there was a young girl named Mary that did have a little lamb. And that story was in the Bible. That's what's happening in this first chapter of Matthew. Joseph, good man, is engaged to a young Jewish girl named Mary. They were betrothed. Now, that, that means much different than in that day than it does in this day. Because being betrothed, they were legally married. They were just not living together. During that time, Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. Joseph knew he was not the father. Now, that's a, that's a problem. I don't know if you realize that, but that's a problem. And Joseph knew that it was a problem because he knew, I'm not the daddy. So he believed that Mary had been unfaithful to him. What else would he believe? So he decided to get a divorce or put her away from him. But he loved her. And because he loved her, he wanted to do it very quietly. He didn't want to draw a whole lot of attention. He just wanted to be quiet about it because the penalty for committing the sin or the crime that Mary was thought to have committed was death by stoning. And the last thing that Joseph wanted was to see Mary stoned to death. That was something she realized that was a possibility. Very early on, when the angel first talked to her, Before he could put his plan into action, God stepped on the scene and sends an angel to tell Joseph things aren't quite like they really seem they are. He tells Joseph that Mary is carrying a child that was miraculously fathered by the Holy Spirit of God. That's important. I don't know if you realize how important that is, but that's tremendously important. Don't go over that point quickly. The angel tells him that this child will be a special child with special mission. In fact, this child will be a savior. He will save his people from their sins. Now that's a lot to try to digest. So it tells me what kind of man Joseph was because his reaction was to take Mary into his home. And he waited until the day that the baby was born to consummate their marriage. What they didn't realize was that this baby that was growing in the womb of Mary was none other than the Lamb of God, the very Son of God. And one day that Lamb would be sacrificed 
that son would be given, would be killed for the sins of every man, woman, and child that's ever lived upon the face of this earth. Verse 25 tells us that Mary eventually delivered the child. When she did, the lamb was born. One of the greatest stories in all of Scripture, we learn the truth that Mary indeed had a little lamb. And his birth was so very, very special. Mary's lamb was special because his conception was special. That the Holy Spirit fathered this child. No human father. I said a few moments ago that that was special, that that was important, that that we, we didn't need to leap over that real quick because his father is God himself. That's what makes the conception of the Lord Jesus so important because she was a virgin. Many, many, many Christians or those who call themselves Christians have a problem with that. Whole denominations are denying the virgin birth. They're saying that there was no way that the Holy Spirit would move upon somebody and she would remain a virgin and give birth to a child. That it's an impossibility. Yes, it is with man, but not with God. Let me tell you something. If you take away the virgin birth, you take away a sinless Savior. In the natural, we understand. So we can't look at this thing in the natural. The conception of Jesus was different. It was supernatural. His mother was a virgin until the day of His birth. It's impossible for you and me, for mankind to be saved and deny the truth of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take that out and you take the sinless Savior out with it so his conception was special but his life was special also from the day that Jesus came into the world until the day he ascended back into heaven he was a person of very special characteristics he did miracles regularly He could take a couple of little loaves of bread, biscuits, basically. Go down to KFC and get one of their biscuits or something. And break it and feed a multitude. That's a miracle. Blinded eyes were open. The sick were healed and the dead were raised. Walking on water, that was no problem for Jesus. Neither was stilling a violent storm. 
Everything he did marked him as that special person. However, these activities were merely proofs that he was indeed who he claimed to be. Being the very Son of God. Being born in such a miraculous way. Miracles were just a part. Because his message was special also. When he opened his mouth, people marveled at the things that he would say. The Bible on several different uh, instances talks about the people marveling at what he said. If you read God's word, you will marvel at it also. Because that word still speaks to us today. The answer to every problem that you'll ever have is right there. All you have to do is just read it. And you'll begin to see it. The doctors of the law, even when he was 12 years old, they were astonished. In Luke chapter 2 verse 47. At the wisdom. The insight that he had. In his ministry he continued to amaze the crowds that heard him speak. His methods. So not only his miracles and his message, but his methods. The way that Jesus carried himself set him apart from everybody else. There had never been another like him. Before or since. There was only one. He never stooped to the level of his enemies. He always kept his father's will in the center of his focus. He never allowed pride to get in his way. He was humbled in spirit. Nothing mattered to Jesus but pleasing the Father and doing what He wanted. There's never been anyone like Jesus and there never will be. He was truly Mary's little lamb. And He was truly very, very special. And it's at this time of year that we celebrate that. His claim was special. Think about it for a moment, if you would. Jesus was never shy about telling people who he was. If you wanted to know, are you the son of God? Just ask him. He, yes. Yes, I am. His claims were what caused the Jews to seek his death. They said it was blasphemy. What was the claim that Jesus made that was so offensive? It was a twofold claim. But it's a claim that you and I can't overlook. It's something that we have to understand and we have to see. Something that we have to accept. First of all, he claimed to be the very Son of God. Now, either he is or he isn't. He says that he is. In John 10, 36, Jesus claimed that he was the Son of God in heaven. All the people said, no, no, we, we know he, he's the son of Joseph. We know who he is. But Jesus 
proclaimed a special relationship with the Heavenly Father. Why is that important? It's important because it's essential for our salvation. Just as the doctrine of the virgin birth is essential to our salvation, so also is the doctrine that Jesus is the Son of God. Until a person, an individual, you or me, comes to the place that we're willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, you can't be saved. If He's not the Son of God, and if He's not born of a virgin, then there's no salvation for us. Because salvation is predicated on him being the spotless, sinless sacrifice. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him, who? That son of God. Without those two things being true, and, and that, that's what Christmas is all about. A virgin giving birth. And the Son of God coming to earth. It's not about stores and presents and trees. It's not even about food and family. It's about a Savior taking our place, loving us so much and until we receive Him that way and until we see Him that way, then all we're doing is treading water. But there was a second claim. Not only was he claiming to be the Son of God, he was claiming to be God. John chapter 14, verse 9, and John chapter 8, verse 58. John 10, 30. Those are claims. And it was even more offensive to the Jews. I mean, it's one thing to say that you're the Son of God. It's another thing to say that you are God. And that, that gave them a problem. Because Jesus was saying that He was eternal. If He's God, He had no beginning and He had no end. He was eternal. Just as the Father is eternal. But I think what galled him the most was he was saying that he was their God. They didn't like that one bit. I mean, it's all right if you're a God, but you ain't my God. That, that was their attitude. Because if he was their God, they had to bow before him. And there was no way they were going to do that. There's a lot of Christians. There's a lot of church folk that are willing to say that Jesus is the Son of God. They're willing to say that he is God. But they're not willing to say that he's their Lord. They're not going to bow before him. I'll do things my way. They were in that camp. They said, no, 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 no. 
I, I'm not bowing before you. I'm not acknowledging that you're my God. They were just not willing to do that. This lamb was special. But not only was Mary's little lamb special, Mary's little lamb was a sacrificial lamb. He came into the world for one purpose. The reason that he came into the world was not to walk on water. It was not to heal the sick. It was not to open blinded eyes or to calm storms. Jesus came into the world for one purpose, and that was dying. He came to die. He was a special lamb, yes but a sacrificial lamb. He came to die for the sins of all men and women. And Luke tells us that that mission in this world was to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. If he was going to accomplish that, then that meant he was going to have to pay a price. That little babe of Bethlehem that you and I, when we set up our, our little scenes of the manger, that babe that's in that cradle, he, he was a lamb that was going to die. He had to pay the price. And he paid that price when he went to the cross. And he died for our sins. Now there, there was a prerequisite to that. So understand it. He had to be a spotless lamb. God had already set out in Leviticus and in Numbers that the lamb that had, was offered had to be spotless. How did you ensure that? In Numbers chapter 28, it says that the lamb that was to be offered for, for the nation of Israel, it was brought before the, the high priest and uh, those that were in his cabinet, the Sanhedrin. And they would examine that lamb. I mean, thoroughly. There could not be a spot, there could not be a blemish. An animal that was impure, one that was deformed, could not be offered. For Jesus to be a sacrifice for our sins demanded that he was perfect in every way, inside and out. So not only was mankind looking him over, inspecting him, but heaven was too. Satan was too. Satan was looking for every flaw. But it says that Satan came to him and found nothing in him. So Satan said he was perfect. God said he was perfect. Man said he was perfect. Jesus Filled that bill perfectly. He was a man without spot or blemish. So not only was he the son of God, he was a sinless son of God. 
So he was able to die on a cross. Because when he died on the cross, he filled that huge prerequisite that he shed innocent blood. He did not deserve to die. You and I do. He did not. He was dying in the place of we that were guilty sinners. He had never committed a sin. He had never stepped over that boundary. He was a pure lamb dying for a wretched world. He was a submissive lamb. Not only spotless, but he was submissive. Nobody forced him into that role as a sacrifice. Voluntary job. He willingly submitted. Why? Because he loved so much. He loved me. He loved you. He was God in the flesh. Remember and think about it for a moment. The Bible says he could have called down 12 legions of angels had he wanted to. All he'd had to do is just say the word, just hint. And don't you know heaven would have emptied? And every angel there was would have come to his aid. They knew who he was. But he didn't. He endured the shame. He endured the pain. Never uttered a word. Like a lamb before her shears was mute. Was silent. He was submissive. Because the father had already placed the price for sin. The wages of sin is death. Either you're dying or he's dying. And he chose to die. When Jesus did utter a word, when he did speak, The only thing he asked for was forgiveness for his tormentors. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus could be found praying for the Father's will to be done. Whether it was in the garden or wherever he might be praying. He was a sacrificed lamb. And we're almost to bring this thing home. Nothing else mattered if he was not the sacrificed lamb. Christmas didn't matter. The virgin birth didn't matter. The sinless life didn't matter. All the miracles didn't matter. If he was not the sacrifice lamb. It wasn't enough for him to be sinless and surrendered. He had to die. He had to suffer before sin could be done away with. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 makes it very plain. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood had to be shed. Innocent blood. And he was the only one. The only one that had innocent blood. So it was his or nothing. He willingly paid the price. And when that blood was pouring from his body and life was ebbing away, it was like a giant billboard flashing, screaming, the awesome love of God for all mankind, that every sinner that had come to the end of his rope could find their way to him and find forgiveness and find peace. He said, I don't know about that. I don't have peace. Then I question your surrender. How much have you surrendered to him? How much control have you kept back? He was a special lamb. He was a sacrificial lamb. He's a saving lamb. If our story ended right there, Jesus dead on a cross, it'd be a sad story to tell. There'd be no reason to celebrate Christmas. What's all the excitement about? A baby was born. There'd be no need for excitement because there was no salvation and there's no hope in Him. Just another baby. If He died and that was the end... then our celebration here today would be mute. But thank God it's not the end. Thank God it's not over. It's not the end of Him and it's not the end of us. The story doesn't end there. Three days after He died on the cross, This perfect, spotless lamb raised from the dead and came out of the tomb alive. He's still alive today and sits at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. The Lamb of God, Mary's little lamb, is busy today ministering for you and me. What is he doing? Well, let me just name them real quick. Number one, he has the power to save sinners. Those who are lost in sin have hope today. Not in themselves, not in a church. Man, you're looking for flaws. You're in the right place. Every church I've ever pastored, every church I've ever been associated with is full of flaws because it's full of people. So who can we blame? Just look at the person next to you and say, you're the problem. Of course, remember, when you're pointing at somebody else, there's two of them pointing at you. And probably the one in front of you and behind you, too. We can have hope. But nothing in that which is made of man, it's that which is made of God. 
when we turn to Jesus with all of our heart, He said that He would save us and that He would give us joy and that He would give us peace and He would give us hope. But not only can He save sinners, He can cleanse sin. So He can cleanse sinners. His blood has the power to wash away sins forever. And I sure am thankful for that. Because I was stacking them up pretty high. And deep. And wide. When He washes you. By His blood. Sin is no longer an issue in your life. Every sin from that moment forward or that moment past, maybe I should say, it's gone. When you truly have put your sin under His blood, then you are clean. And then He says to you, go and sin no more. And every time I slip up, I want to get that sin under his blood as quickly as possible. Because that's the only thing that can cleanse. But not only does he save sinners and cleanse sinners, he changes sinners. I'm I'm not the person I used to be. Thank goodness. Because you wouldn't have liked me. When he saves someone, he changes that person from the inside out. So can I just say to you this morning, if you've been putting off total surrender, if you've been putting off because maybe you're afraid that you can't really do it, Maybe you're afraid and don't really want to do it. Maybe you're thinking, I, uh, I, I can't change. Nothing will ever be different. Can I say you're right? Because you can't change. But He can change you. As you surrender to Him, salvation belongs to the Lord. Let Him save you. If you could save you, you wouldn't need Him. So you can't save you. Oh, but I do the best I can. Your best ain't good enough. Only in Him. So tonight, tomorrow, this Christmas season, this Christmas year, as you're gathering with your family and your friends or maybe just you and your wife, keep things in perspective. It's wonderful. I, I'm looking forward to when my grandbabies come. We're going to have us some Christmas. But I like to tell them about Jesus. I want them to keep it in perspective also. I understand that some of the stores are open today. I hope you don't have to work. I hope you've got all your shopping done. If not, wait until after Christmas. They'll be cheaper. (laughs) Commercialism. This world of fantasy that we've Made, that's all the hope some people's got. 
Give somebody Jesus. Tell them the truth. Share the truths of this message. Because this is the important message. Bow your heads with me, would you please?